Okay, so in the second half, I will continue the same line of reasoning as in the first half. Uh, just step by step, getting to the conclusion of how the Big Bang model looks and what are the ingredients of the universe. So what is the score so far? Let me repeat what I just said before we took a break. The theory of gravity allows for an expanding universe. We observe a correlated period periodicity and luminosity in Cepheids when correcting for nearby distances. So Berides are very special stars. This is not true for all stars. This is a very special kind. Then we correlate the received flux and the redshift of spectra of very distant stars. And from that we infer that there is an expansion of the universe because the redshift is clearly correlated with the distance to objects. So, given the expansion of the universe, now we take this model and we look at what this implies. The universe must have been once small, dense and hot. And it's cooling by expansion, because it's very cold right now, but if you go sufficiently far back in time, all the matter is pushed together. And just like the interior of your bicycle pump, um, no, maybe this metaphor works better in the Netherlands, things warm up if you push them together. And they cool down if you let them expand. That means that there must have been a hierarchy of temperatures in the history of the universe. By, by which I simply mean <clears throat> the universe was very hot and is at any time cooling down. So there must be a relation between the temperature of the universe and the age of the universe. And then if you, simp if you only write down that as a model, not doing observations, but just taking the model and look at its implications, <coughs> you get to a hierarchy that looks like this, and certain events that happen in the history of the universe. I took this table from lecture notes by Daniel Bauman, which I think are good notes. I just stumbled upon them by googling them, but if you uh, want to look at good notes, go to this URL. So, the universe was once very dense and hot, and it's today very large and cold. Now, let's see. Um, any temperature of the plasma can be related to an energy. I guess you are more familiar with the conversion from electron volts to temperatures than me, or maybe not. But anyway, uh, high energy, high electron volts. So today the universe is very cold. If you go back a little bit, the universe was opaque. So the photons were coupled, opaque, sorry, the photons were coupled to the plasma that fills the universe. And this plasma had a certain temperature. If you go further back, not only um, were the photons coupled to the atoms in the universe, but the, the plasma was so hot that the atoms were actually not bound. So the um, protons and electrons were not coupled. This was an ionized plasma. If you go back further up in the temperature, you are at temperatures where the protons actually can form higher um, elements, larger elements. So you can synthesize nucleons, you can synthesize, you go from hydrogen to helium, etc. So the universe was like the, in, the inside of a star, gen synthesizing nucleons. If you go to higher temperatures, even, even smaller universe, you reach the temperatures where electrons and positrons are annihilating, or even higher temperatures where they don't even annihilate, etc. So the other way around, universe was extremely hot and possibly baryons were, gen uh, were, were synthesized, were generated, but we don't know. This is all speculation. If the universe was hotter than the temperature of the electroweak phase, phase transition, then this electroweak phase transition must have happened in the early universe. QCD phase transition must have later happened at lower temperature. Another unknown is whether the dark matter species were generated and then froze out from the plasma. At some point, the neutrinos start decoupling from your plasma. At a later time, the electrons and positrons start annihilating, releasing new photons into the plasma. 
the elements in the early universe are generated, helium and, and only a few more larger elements, lithium, and that's basically it. A recombination means that the electrons bound to the protons, so the plasma has cooled down so far that electrons and protons can form bound states, atoms, that's recombination. Cooling down further, the photons can decouple from the plasma, and what happens later is astrophysics, and I will not touch reionization too much. So this is simply what you can write down if you realize that the universe is expanding. And physics works the way we know it works on Earth. So to which of these do we have access observationally? And that is an important question in cosmology. It might, you, you may actually want to search for means to get access to all the other events, because each event <coughs> produced certain characteristics in the universe that you may observe. So one important ingredient that we have access to is the abundance of certain of different elements in the universe. By looking at gas clouds that were never part of a stellar system, that are just floating out in the universe, we, well, we don't know if they were part of a stellar system because we cannot ask them, but we see them in a place and infer that they were not part of a stellar system. And we look at the light that is emitted by these gas clouds. They're not stars, so it is radio emission. But still, by looking at the emission, we can look at what elements are in there, and we can actually see what the ratio of helium and lithium to hydrogen is. So the answer, the answer is that um, they're, they're continuously annihilating, but also creating again. So there is, a, there is a, a, an equilibrium, as, as you were saying, in, indeed very well. Electrons and positrons are continuously annihilating and creating. But at some point, the plasma cools down below a temperature where the creation does not happen anymore. So there's only the final annihilation, and that's it. That's the end of the story. But fortunately, there's an asymmetry, and there are some electrons left, and not so many positrons anymore. Otherwise, the universe would be without electrons. And what do we do then? Um, right, so we have access to Big Bang nucleosynthesis. We can look at the elements that come from the earliest stages of the universe. This is a way, and actually the theory predicts the abundance of the elements very well. This is one of the big successes of the Big Bang theory, that you get the right abundances of light elements, hydrogen, helium, and lithium. Well, lithium not exactly, but almost. But you can tell us all about that, right? And th this, is, this is, apart from the observed expansion, this is a very important argument in favor of the Big Bang theory. The fact that the elements have the right abundances in the universe. Another event in the universe that we have access to is the decoupling of the photons. From one moment to the other, the universe became transparent. So, if you can look far enough, you can actually look for this moment happening. At any time in the history of the universe, any observer will see photons coming from this event, the decoupling of the photons. But the distance he is looking at depends on the age of the universe. For example, let me try to sketch that here. Um, if I live here, and the universe is two-dimensional, this is the universe, and it's been one hour ago since the photons decoupled, I will be receiving photons that have traveled exactly one light hour since the decoupling of photons. So, one hour after photon decoupling, I will receive the photons that come from this surface around me. Does that make sense? The photons decouple, they start free, travel, traveling freely. Initially, they were just scattering in the plasma. At some point, it <coughs> suddenly traveled freely. So, <coughs> one hour after that moment, I observe all the photons that come from one light hour away from me. Two hours later, of course, it's the same story, but at a different surface. And 13 giga years later, it's still the same story, because we observe these photons today, coming from a distance in the universe that corresponds to the distance they could have traveled in 13, that they have traveled in 13 giga years. So this is a very important event, because this is the production of the cosmic microwave background radiation. 
It's the decoupling of the photons from the early universe plasma. And they have since then been traveling through the universe. So we can really see, well, not by eye, but with radio telescopes, we actually have the detection of these physical photons that came from the early universe into our detectors. Of course, the photon does not tell you that it comes from the early universe. I, let me draw a different picture. Well, actually, draw, let me draw the same picture at a different time. This is us. The time direction is in the vertical direction, and the space direction is in the horizontal direction. Is this visible for everyone? Photons travel with the speed of light, so photons travel with a line that here has a, um, has a derivative of x that follows this line, x equals c times t. So this is a light cone, I live here. If this is the time at which photons last scattered, so the C and B, then the photons that I observe from the C and B today come from this point and this point in these two dimensions, <coughs> because they've been traveling to me with the speed of light. From the picture I drew earlier, an observer that is looking at the C and B just one hour after the, big after the photon decoupling is living here, observe the photons coming from there and there. Okay, now what I wanted to say is the following. We receive these photons, we're sitting here, and we can only observe angles and intensities and wavelengths. So we sit here, we observe photons at 140 gigahertz, and we think that they come from this distance. But fundamentally, it's really not possible to tell whether they come from this distance, or we just happen to live in a funny universe where at this point and this point somebody emitted light in our direction with exactly this wavelength, exactly this temperature. That could be the case. And we really cannot tell the difference. So if we draw the two-dimensional picture, if we live here and we observe the C and B on the surface, there's no way to tell whether the surface that we are observing comes from here or actually comes from much nearer by and is emitted towards us. This observe, if, if it is this case, then the light comes from here. If it is this surface, then the light comes from here. Okay, I'm trying to explain this because it's important to realize that we do observe this light, which is very convincingly uh, confirming the model of the Big Bang, but fundamentally we cannot be sure. It could have been emitted as a foreground. Um, okay, so the model predicted photon decoupling, and we observe photons that actually look as if they come from such a remote surface at the Big Bang Theory. The model predicted the, the synthesizing of nuclei, and we observe that in the universe as well. Okay, so um, I just highlighted a few of these. Maybe you will, will remember them, maybe you will not. But these are the moments to which we have access. And I put neutrino decoupling in orange because we don't observe it exactly. But from the shape of the light that we receive from photon decoupling, we do infer that there must have been the presence of certain particles that look like neutrinos, that at least that behave like neutrinos at the time of photon decoupling. So they probably were there. That's why I put it in orange. Uh, I should have put this slide actually before the previous one, because the universe was dense and hot, very much like the interior of a star, so it was opaque. And if you look at a star and you go towards the edge, you go to a higher um, higher radii of the star, and there the star is cooler. So at some point you reach the edge of the star where it becomes transparent. The sun is not infinitely large, at the edge it becomes transparent. And that's exactly the transition from too hot to be uh, transparent to transparent. So the cosmic microwave background was first um, was postulated, was predicted by the Big Bang Theory. Actually, I took this nice table from Wikipedia, which shows the history of the cosmic microwave background. It was Gamow that estimates a temperature of 50 Kelvin, 
based on simple arguments about the universe, in 1946, then the um, estimates have gone, have gone on in time, so people studied it. And in the 60s, um, Penzias and Wilson were not cosmologists, they were just designing radio antennas. And to test the noise on the antennas, they would always aim it at the black sky, at the dark sky, and any signal they would get would be noise, and they would have to work better on their antenna to get the noise level down. Until they got to the point where, aiming it at the black sky, they could not get rid of the noise, whatever they did. And then they walked into the university towards an astronomer who said, ah, I know what that is, that is the microwave background. That was the first detection of the cosmic microwave background radiation. So its postulate had been around for a few decades. The model that predicted it had been already written down in the 20s, and in the 60s it was actually observed. A radiation that comes from all directions in the sky at a temperature that makes perfect sense for a radiation that comes from the Big Bang. So after Big Bang nucleosynthesis, the observation of the cosmic microwave background is one of the most convincing arguments in favor of the expansion of the universe. Um, now a brief story about the cosmic microwave background, because I've, um, it, is, it is one of the most important sources of information for cosmology. And the way it provides us with information is uh, actually manifold. There are many ways in which it can give us information. And today I'm focusing very much on the expansion of the universe. So I will only uh, briefly touch on the cosmic microwave background as another measurement of the expansion of the universe and the expansion history of the universe. Uh, for a historical note, I list here the three important microwave background satellites. And <clears throat> I list them here not only to, um, to protect history, but also because you still uh, see these names coming by in cosmological publications and cosmological talks today. The first one is the COBE, the Cosmic Background Explorer, um, to, for which the PIs received the Nobel Prize, which measured the absolute temperature of the cosmic microwave background on the full sky to an incredible accuracy. The microwave background has a temperature of 2.7255 Kelvin. This is a number that many cosmologists know from the top of their head. Also, it provided the first full sky observation of tiny anisotropies in the microwave background temperatures. So the temperature in every direction has this value, 2.7255 Kelvin. But the digits beyond that actually vary in the different directions of the universe. And it's these tiny fluctuations in the temperature in the different directions that are a very important source of information in cosmology. So after the COBE satellite, the WMAP satellite was launched to work as a micro microwave anisotropy probe, which um, I think just stopped running now, but maybe not, there may still be papers coming out, which did not measure the absolute temperature. It only measured the difference in temperatures in two different directions, and then repeating that over the full sky. So still, the COBE satellite remains the only one that measured the temperature of the cosmic microwave background on the full sky. And then, of course, there was the Planck satellite, which, which uh, caused a lot of noise in the last two years because it observed the maximally boring universe. The Planck satellite, again, did not measure the absolute temperature of the CMB. It measured the anisotropies in the temperature, and it measured the polarization of the temperature. Uh, sorry, it measured the polarization of the photons. Uh, polarization is something I will not talk about today. That will come in the next lecture. When you mean that you not measure temperature, you mean you measure Well, WMAP really doesn't even measure the intensity in one direction. It only measures the difference in intensity um, in two directions. So WMAP really has no handle on the, uh, for, for as far as I understand, I'm not an experimentalist to work on it, but my understanding is that WMAP really has no handle on the absolute temperature. But I mean, the difference in temperature does concern the fifth digit, you know, one in 10 to the fifth. Exactly. So in a way... But it could have been 10 Kelvin. For WMAP it could have been 10 Kelvin. Okay, it couldn't have been temperature uh, 10 Kelvin because this, the instrument was designed to measure it exactly at this temperature. So uh, if it had not had the temperature, the outcome would have been different. But um, 
from the method of the measurement of W map, it could have been a different temperature. That's the that's that's what I'm, I'm trying to say. Yeah, and I think well, I I don't know too much about the, the technical design of Planck, but I think also for Planck this is true. So Planck certainly did not measure the temperature at this accuracy, but it only measures the anisotropies at that accuracy. So this is what the sky looks like at the temperatures of radiation that the Planck satellite looked at in galactic coordinates. Remember that the ecliptic plane follows a nice S shape through this figure. The galaxy is exactly in this plane. So the temperature in each of these pixels is 2.7255 Kelvin, plus or minus the number that this color corresponds to. Red means that it's hot by 1 in 10 to the fifth, and blue means that it's cold by 1 in 10 to the fifth, roughly. So we see that the cosmic microwave background in all directions is incredibly homogeneous with tiny, tiny anisotropies of the order of 10 to the minus 5. And what you can do with this map is take the Fourier transform, just take the Fourier transform of this image. Of course, it's a sphere, so you do a spherical harmonics expansion, which is the equivalent of a Fourier transform on a uh, closed space. And the Fourier transform, so the spherical harmonics expansion actually, let me stop saying Fourier. The spherical harmonics expansion of that sphere gives you this beautiful peaked structure. So without saying anything about where it comes from, if you just observe the cosmic microwave background, you look at the anisotropies with varying resolution, or actually with a very good resolution, so you, uh, you, you observe very small pixels on the sky. The, the, the spherical harmonics expansion of that map gives you a beautifully peaked structure. So what is the ingredients, what are the ingredients that are going into this map? We observe angles and we observe wavelengths. That is truly what we are observing. We don't observe the Big Bang happening, we don't observe that these photons actually traveled from far to here. We only see that at this wavelength there is a distribution of anisotropies in the, in the angles on the sky, which gives you this multiple expansion. Now, this peak is the first acoustic peak of the uh, microwave background anisotropies. tells you that in the map, since the spherical harmonic expansion gives you a peak, there must be a characteristic scale. And that is exactly what this map, map tells you. You don't see regularities at a very large angular scale. And if, if you will, there, there are regularities that you can recognize by eye in this map. It is not, I mean, if it were anisotropies at only much smaller scales, it would just look like a blur. The anisotropies are such that on this screen you can see that there are anisotropies on it. That's simply the statement that tells you that there is a peak in the structure. There is a typical size for these hot and cold points in this map. And you can trust the experimentalists. The typical size does not come from the size of the, uh, of the image that you're taking, of the resolution of the image. It's, it's really a typical size in the background radiation. So in the next course, I will try to explain how you compute this peaked structure. That will be a, a, a difficult task for one hour and a half, but I will give it a shot anyway. And I will, maybe more interestingly, try to explain you what this peak structure would have looked like with different ingredients in the universe. How do these peaks change if you change the amount of dark matter in the universe? How do these peaks change if you change the amount of dark energy, the amount of baryons, the and, and photons and the age of the universe also is a very important ingredient in here. I will, I will try to touch these things because I think that's most interesting. If you don't want to do CMB calculations, you still want to understand qualitatively how these peaks differ if you put in different matter. Um, but that's part of the next course, otherwise there's nothing to tell the other day, the next day. Um, but still, there is one characteristic scale in there at a particular wavelength. We see, we observe a characteristic angular scale, and we observe an intensity at a wavelength, 
And we have a model that very clearly describes when these photons were decoupled from the fluid of the universe. And we understand astrophysics quite well. We can tell you at which temperature the gas becomes transparent. And for the, for the uh, composition of the universe, this temperature is roughly 3000 Kelvin. Okay, it's, it's actually an experiment you can repeat in the lab because 3000 3, Kelvin is, is like the temperature of a light bulb. That's why light bulb emits the same color of light as the sun does. The decoupling of photons was at roughly 3000 Kelvin. It's when the universe became transparent. We observe it today at roughly 3 Kelvin. Fortunately, temperature redshifts exactly the same way as, as line spectra do. So this translates directly into a redshift at which the CMB decoupled. It's at a redshift of roughly 1000, 1100 actually. Okay, so now back to the di story of distances. We observe an angle and a wavelength. We, we observe it at roughly one degree. We know its original temperature, so we know that it's at, uh, well, we think we know. We, and we think we know, therefore, that it's at a redshift of 1000. So we have a measurement of a redshift and an angle of a feature. Um, now there's one more ingredient we need to know before we can tell at what distance the object was. We observe an angle. And we want to know the distance d, because then we have a relation between the redshift 1000 and the distance to the surface of a redshift 1000. Um, you can know this distance d if you know the angle alpha and you know the original physical size of the object y that you're observing. Because then, of course, you know by simple, uh, simple geometry that the tangent of alpha will give you give you the size d. So y is, uh, sorry, d is y divided by alpha. In two dimensions, this means that the distance that you infer from the angular size of something is given by the 2D surface divided by the 2D angle that the object spans, and then the square root of that, which gives you in general relativity that the angular diameter distance to an object is the scale factor at the time that you observe it, times the coordinate distance to the object. This is uh, very quickly, I'm not really explaining the computation, but I'm just showing you what the meaning of the angular diameter distance is. It's the distance that you infer to an object given the angle at which you observe it and given the original physical size. Um, this is related to the luminosity distance, which is the distance that you infer to an object if you know its intensity. And that is the distance that I talked about before when I talked about cepheids, which are standard candles. These are objects of which we know the intensity, we observe the flux, we infer a distance. That is the luminosity distance. So the flux is given by the original luminosity divided by the surface of some imaginary sphere, which is, with, which is given by the radius of this distance, which we call the luminosity distance. And if you, if you write down the equations and you realize that the luminosity of an object actually... Um, or the intensity of a photon fluid actually changes with the expansion of the universe with a factor of a to the minus four, then you get to the conclusion that the luminosity distance, oop, this one should be a superscript, luminosity distance is given by the radial distance in coordinates divided by the scale factor. The angular diameter distance is given by the scale factor times the radial coordinate. Therefore, luminosity distance and angular diameter distance differ by a factor of scale factor squared. Um, I'm not showing you this because I want you to remember exactly how this, relation, um, how this relation arises, but I do want you to take home that luminosity distance and angular diameter distance measure exactly the same thing up to a factor 1 plus redshift squared, scale factor squared. This relation is only violated, sorry, this relation is only violated if photons are not conserved, because that's where the 1 plus z squared comes from. So in standard physics, if, if the photons really travel through a completely transparent universe and make it all the way towards us, there's an exact relation that luminosity, uh, luminosity distance is angular diameter distance times 1 plus redshift squared. Now why this story? Because assume for the moment that we know what this typical distance in the cosmic microwave background corresponds to in terms of physical distance. We sit here. We observe the CMB here. 
And we observe that there is a typical anisotropy. which is just give by dashes. And this anisotropy is observed. We, we sit here, we observe it at roughly one degree. Assume for the moment that we know what this particular size corresponds to. The model namely tells us. I will tell you in the, in the next courses how we can infer what the typical distance of the anisotropies in the cosmic microwave background is. If we know that, then we observe the angle. We know the physical size. We can infer the angular diameter distance to that object, which is the same as the luminosity distance for these standard candles uh, times a factor of redshift. So you can relate the two. Therefore, the cosmic microwave background adds to the same diagram if you continue this line to redshift 1100. So this diagram gives us luminosity distances to objects in redshifts between 0 and 1. That means that the light coming from here is um, redshifted by a factor of 2. It's only half um, as energetic as it was uh, upon emission. This diagram now has an extra data point added to it at redshift 1100 because of the observation of the cosmic microwave background with a typical anisotropy at one degree that corresponds to a physical distance that we can compute. Now this typical distance in the CMB, I already called it the first acoustic peak, it is because of oscillations in the baryon photon plasma prior to photon decoupling. And the same oscillations left their imprint in the large scale structure. And that is something that I will talk about in the third lecture, how the large scale structure actually takes um, how the structure grows from a fluid in which these baryonic acousti uh, acoustic oscillations left their imprint of a typical scale, which in the CMB is one degree, but in the BAOs it's 100 megaparsecs, and also gives us another standard ruler on the sky. So now I hope that I convince you that we have a, d a number of different observations of distances in the universe at different redshifts. So we see that at different distances there's a different redshift, so there's a clear um, evidence, so to say, that the universe is expanding because at different distances <coughs> things have different velocities. And why is this so important for the story of today? Well, because of the very first equation that I gave you, namely, um, I didn't repeat it here, but I did repeat it on this slide. The very first equation that I gave you, the expansion rate of the universe is given by its matter content, cosmological constant, and the spatial curvature. This is the expansion rate. From the expansion rate you can compute what is the distance to a certain redshift. Um, let's, let's go through this slide line by line. The luminosity distance is the angular diameter distance divided by the scale factor squared or times 1 plus 1 z squared because photons redshift linearly with the scale factor. If the universe grows twice as large, my photons will have stretched twice as long, so the wavelength will have doubled, means the frequency will have halved. So if the universe is twice as large, the photons will get a redshift of 1. The universe is three times as large, they are the redshift of two, etc. Now, I showed you in the previous slide very briefly, but not really explaining it, that the angular diameter distance is given by the scale factor times the coordinate radius to that point. Is there a question? No question? No? If <clears throat> now, we're talking about photons. And Photons travel according to certain laws in general relativity, in special relativity as well, and we know exactly how they travel in our metric. So they travel on the S squared is equal to zero, they're, tra they're traveling on null geodesics, and if we remember the metric, um, oh, I erased it from everywhere. Where did the metric go? Here we have the metric. Photons travel on lines that are given by this thing equal to zero, so dt squared must be equal to this part here. Otherwise it doesn't cancel to zero. 
and in radial coordinates, that means in this thing. So if without laws of generality, gener <laughs> without laws of generality, and without laws of general relativity, we can set ourselves at the origin of this coordinate system, and it means that all photons traveling toward us are traveling on radial lines. So we can ignore the angular dependence of this part. So anything that travels on a geodesic that is given by the S squared equal to zero, a null geodesic, travels on a line that is given by dt squared is equal to a squared dr squared. And now I go back to the computation that I wanted to show. The S squared is zero, so dt is equal to a times dr. So you can compute in a very simple integral <coughs> what the coordinate radius is as a function of time that you're looking at. And it turns out, <coughs> so the integral dr is integral dt over a. r is, of course, then that integral. That's just a re repetition. And we can rewrite this equation <coughs> to an integral over the scale factor. It's just a substitution of variables because the scale factor is a function of t. This dt can be written as dt over dt times dA over dA. You cancel out all the things that you don't want. You end up with an integral over with dA over a dot. And now comes the interesting part. This a dot, of course, is given by the equation that I have written here in a different form. A dot is given by the matter contents of the universe, given by this equation. And I've written, I've repeated exactly this equation in a slightly different form here. Um, I've replaced the scale factors by 1 over 1 plus z. Um, and I've assumed that there's only a particular type of matter. I will not address these details much further, but the point is, it's very simple. Actually, this equation, I think, is the most important to realize. The distance to objects is related to redshift. It is a function of redshift. And The relation between redshift and distance is given exactly by the matter content of the universe. So if you put more um, dark matter in the universe, the relation between luminosity distance and the redshift at which we observe objects changes. If I put more photons in the universe, this changes. If I put more dark energy in the universe, this relation changes. So the line here that fits through these data points is a line that comes exactly from computing the integral that I just showed. This line changes if you put in more or less dark energy, and the line changes if you put in more or less dark matter, because that's the line that tells you how the expansion rate relates to the observed distance to objects. And the cosmic microwave background is a very important point at a very high redshift, so it gives you a big leverage on this line, and that's why all the observations together um, play together to give us this pi of the universe. So because we, because we um, so I've, I've almost come to the end. So let me summarize. We only observe angles, redshifts, and intensities. We see that there's relations between luminosities of objects and their, for example, their periodicity, or in the case of supernovae, there's a relation between their uh, luminosity and the, the shape of the light curve in time, because they explode and then they dim out again. There turns out to be a relation between these things. We, know the we think we know the luminosity of the original objects. We observe them at a redshift. From this, we infer that the universe is expanding. Same goes for the cosmic microwave background. We think we know the physical distance that describes the character characteristic scale in the cosmic microwave background. We I think we know the redshift at which the cosmic microwave background was emitted, so that also gives us a handle on the distance-redshift relation in the universe. The distance-redshift relation of the universe is given exactly by the ingredients that go into the metric. And it turns out that we need this part of dark energy, 68%, to fit the expansion history of the universe, and we need this much matter in the universe. Actually, when it comes to the expansion rate, the baryons and dark matter Um, at least in the late universe, contribute in exactly the same way. They're indistinguishable for the expansion rate. But the fact that we know that baryons and dark matter have, are present in these ratios comes from other observations, which I will talk about in the other courses. And the photons, we know how much they are because we actually observe in our instruments the cosmic microwave background. We observe the density in that photon uh, component of the universe. 
And as you knows, we don't know. We only know because the model tells them that they have to be there. And the LH, uh, well, the, the, the experimentalists in CERN tell us that they have to be there. So what's next in the other courses? This is the last slide. I hope I convinced you that the universe is expanding and that we only know this because we observe angles, redshifts, and intensities. But what I will address in the other um, lectures is where does the structure in the universe actually come from? What causes the distribution of galaxies? What causes the anisotropies in the cosmic microwave background? How does the structure grow in an expanding universe? What would the cosmic microwave background look like in an expanding universe? And how can this all be learned to you? How, how can this all be used to learn about fundamental physics? And that's it for today. Thanks. Are there any questions? Just one, maybe. Just uh, I get the, the last um, how say calendar of the universe. Say, you know, I, I, I think. I'm not sure, but I don't think they actually fit the, the previous slides. I think they fit the, 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 the power spectrum of the CMB, and then just report what they get from the feet of the CMB on the plot set to show. Is it true, or do they fit also? Do you know? No, you fit, you fit everything, all you can get. Otherwise, it wouldn't, why, would you get, why would you bother getting all this data if you don't use it to fit? I mean, just, it's, it's a way of course, taking, of course, the relation if you get the... But I think the black cut, I, I'm not sure for this one. Yeah. You could get a black cut just by actually fitting the CMB to power spectrum. Yeah. And then putting your data points on this cut and just seeing, yeah. I mean, fitting both will give you, but because of, I think those uh, error bars, my point is because of the error bars you have on the, on the, on the low data, on the low Z data points, I don't think the, you can have such a precision as you have with the CMB to power spectrum. That's not true. You do get uh, such precision. The point is that you... Um, okay, now with the Planck satellite, that's, that's what you're saying. With the, with the Planck satellite, actually by fitting only the CMB data and only the CMB anisotropies, you already get... Um, you, get you get numbers that are like on the, the pie chart that I showed. That's absolutely true. But what would happen if you did that? And the black line, that the, your theoretical line that you get from that, does not go through the data points of the supernovae and through the data points of the BAO. If it would not go through there, then your model is entirely wrong because your model of the cosmic microwave background is in, is in, uh, in contradiction with your nearby observation of the expansion of the universe. So, ultimately, you want a model that explains all the observations that you get. And, of course, you, you test by... Um, looking for parameters that fit to all your data, and you look for parameters that fit only your CMB data and only your supernovae, and you look if they actually prefer different parameters or if they prefer the same parameters. Um, so it is important for your tests that you do all of this, that you do all possible combinations of data. Um, so you certainly do fit the supernovae and cosmic microwave background. And I guess you were talking specifically about the Planck papers and their analysis and the fact that they... Um, but if you, if you read their papers on, on cosmological parameter estimations, they certainly include baryon acoustic oscillation data, and they, uh, they, they do include many other observables. But what if you have some, some complete discrepancies between the values you get from this one? So separately, you get a fit from the low C experiments, and you get a fit from the C and you have discrepancies. If you want to mix the two data sets, you would have something in between. No, but that's when the fun starts, when you get discrepancies, right? So one very nice example is the local expansion rate, the expansion rate nearby. We observe, like Hubble and Lemaitre did, at very low redshift, so really between uh, 0 and 0.1, we observe that there is a certain steepness to this curve. So the luminosity changes as a function of redshift very clearly. And the ex expansion rate that people infer from that curve is much higher then the expansion rate that you get if you look at only the cosmic microwave background data from the Planck satellite. And they differ by, uh, by several sigma. It's of the order of 10% in the value, and it's of the order of 3 sigma, the, the difference between these two values. And that's great fun, right, when you find such a discrepancy, because then you know that you have work to do as a cosmologist, because there's something wrong with the model, and you need to do more to understand it. And this is a very nice example, because... Um, there, there's something very important to keep in mind when you look at these different observations. So, this is the cosmic microwave background. 
and this is where we live. So this circle is at z equal to 1100. Let's make it logarithmic. The local expansion rate that we observe is nearby at z is between uh, 0 and 0 0.2. So when you fit to the cosmic microwave background, you get, um, you get a measurement of the expansion rate of the entire universe that is in this entire volume between us and the surface of last scattering. So that is like an average over this entire sphere. The expansion rate that the, the, the Planck satellite gives us is the expansion rate of the average of this entire sphere. The astronomers that measure the local expansion rate only measure the expansion of this small volume. So what happens if the expansion rate is slightly different from part to part in the universe? In fact, it is slightly different from part to part in the universe. And the question is, how big can the difference be in different parts? And how big is the difference that is predicted by the model? And in fact, it turns out that, that probably about half of the discrepancy in the two effects, unfortunately not everything, but half of the discrepancy comes from the fact that the expansion rate in luminosity distances at low redshifts really measures the local expansion rate, which is not the same as the average expansion rate on this entire sphere. So that is the one example of what happens if there's a discrepancy between the two data sets. And that is also why in, in the Planck team, they decided not to use all cosmological data that is available because they don't trust all the data sets. And for some sets, it's just very discrepant and they don't know if you can combine the two, and they might both be right, but there may be other physics that goes in there, and then you cannot use it to fit your model. Yeah. So you're, you're right in that um, you can do separate data sets, and you can combine data sets. But in, and in most analyses, you do combine data sets, because uh, if you have a model that doesn't fit both data sets, you will find that um, it doesn't work when you use both data sets. <laughs>